good day and uh, welcome to this class uh, in which we will be focusing on liners for landfills. Uh, if you recall last time uh, we discussed a lot of uh, planning of landfills and today we will focus uh, on one of the components which uh, we have to design and that is uh, the liner at the bottom of a landfill which has to ensure that the leachate does not percolate into the ground. Before we do that, let us do a quick recap. And last time, as I said, we were discussing planning of landfills and I would like to uh, very briefly uh, look at uh, this aspect of shape of landfills. Uh, I had shown you a below ground landfill, an above ground landfill and a combination of the two. And these are what are adopted on flat ground. If you have, uh, if you have a, a ground which is not sloping or not a low lying area, not a valley, then your landfill looks like this or this or this. The important point I want to make, which I perhaps did not make last time was that these are vertically exaggerated diagrams. Please understand. Uh, this is the width of the landfill. So this can be very large and this is the depth. This is limited. As I told you, typically this will be 7 to 8 meters um, in unsupported excavation if the water table is deep below. But this width can be large and for municipal solid waste landfills, it can be several hundred meters or it can be a kilometer or two. In hazardous waste landfills, which are a little smaller, which are smaller than municipal solid waste landfills, this dimension can be a few hundred meters. So, if I want to look at this in the correct dimensional perspective, I come here. So, I have just taken the scale that this is uh, about 500 meters long and I said typically the height will be restricted to 15 meters. So, that is 15 meters and here the depth has been restricted to uh, 7 meters. So, these are thin uh, spread out uh, waste repositories on the surface of the ground. When you have a valley, then they will be high and when you have a side slope, then also they can, uh, the, the, the dimensions will be uh, uh, significant in height. But typically on flat ground, they are thin elements. Now here I have got B equal to 500 meters, uh, B means the uh, width and if you look at it, suppose I, I own 500 meter wide. Uh, land which has got a width of 500 meters. I actually own everything beneath that boundary and I own everything above the boundary or is it not so? I don't know. What are the laws? If I have a plot of land, do I own everything under the plot and everything above it? No. So, somebody said I don't. Why not? Who owns what is below my ground? So, there is soil beneath my feet. Who owns that soil? If I wanted to build, build an underground building which was five stories deep, can I build it? So, unless there is an underground utility or a resource or a commonly shared resource, then if it is not there, you can go as deep as you want. Similarly, if I want to go up a kilometer into the sky, if I want to make Burj Khalifa, once I own the land, I own the airspace above it. Unless you are coming in the flight path, for example, the IIT main building cannot be higher than what it is because it is on the landing flight path. So, we are eight, eight stories or nine stories. Suddenly, if we wanted to make a 25 story tower here, we cannot do it because you are on the landing path of the aircraft. So, if there is a common resource being used, then I can be restricted. So, every, every, uh, every person who owns a landfill site wants to use it to a maximum capacity. However, I told you uh, height is restricted from aesthetic considerations. 15 meters high means how many story building? Uh, three and a half meters to a story typically. So, maybe about four. So, you do not want your waste dump to uh, rise above the uh, skyline of the city. So, typically 15 meters high and 7 meters deep from excavation concentrations. However, if I have uh, only a 100 meter width, 
and you didn't ask me, sir, what is this S? Hi, S is the side slope of the above ground portion. If I have 100 meters, then I have a problem. I may have the same area. This may be a square configuration and this may be a very long configuration. But the problem is that this is my airspace and I am using very little of it. Not even 50 percent, not even 33 percent, I am using very little of it. And the other problem is I can't go as high as I want. Because 4 is to 1, you only have, this is 100 meters wide, you only have 50 meters as the horizontal width and the height that you can get if you start from the extreme boundaries is 50 divided by 4, which will be 12.5 uh, meters and not 15 meters. Uh, this is a critical aspect of uh, landfill capacity. Okay. The other thing which I wanted to talk to you last time about was the estimation of landfill capacity and we talked about waste generation W tons per year. We talked of N years as being the life of a landfill and we said total waste in N years is W into N. So I also mentioned that this is not, this is a very approximate formula. In fact, this is an underestimation because your population is growing or decreasing uh, and you have to do a correct estimate. And at first I asked you all to come up with some figures about this waste generation per capita per day in various cities. So I, I, you must have discovered this by now. So in India, what kind of figures did you get? And uh, in, in another country, what kind of figures did you get? So so anybody would like to give me some figures which you came across? So Mumbai, we have one figure. Now we are talking of kg, 0.63 kg per person per day. Uh, anybody has any other Indian city? Bangalore. You mean Bengaluru? If you got a figure of 0 0.39, is it very recent or old? It was 2005. Oh, 2005 is very old. Your data is for which year? No, no. I, I, I mean, sure. So, if this is 2005. I can say that this is like your, if you put money in your fixed deposit, what will happen to it after five years? It will double. So uh, the, you may like to give me a more updated figure. Anybody else has a more recent figure for any other city? Which year? So you have the same source? Do you go to Wikipedia? Okay, great. Did you go to CPCB or Ministry of Urban Affairs? Which website did you attack to know that this is correct? Anyways, I think uh, very revealing, but we are above 0.5 uh, uh, kilogram per person per day in the metro cities. So anybody has got now figures from overseas mega cities? Hanji, aapne kiya hai? Tokyo. Tokyo. Okay, what was the figure? 1.38. 1 do you have the year? And do remember Tokyo is uh, an island in Japan. I mean, we are in Japan, which is, you know, waterlocked. You don't have much space. They want to keep minimum waste because you don't have much area to dispose it. They don't have too much land. Anybody else? So that's fine. I mean, that's fine. So we are reconfirming 1.27 in 2011. So it seems to be recent. Any other major city in Europe or Paris? Paris. Okay. 
1.50 to 2.00. You have the year? Between 12 to 14. Okay, anybody in America? Where? London. London. Give me US. Yeah. Okay. New York. 2.75. Anybody would confirm 2.75? 4.5. 4.5? Four point five is a little bit high. Wow. So somebody said two point seven six. So we'll say two point seven six to five point zero zero. So uh, all that I want to say is this is a huge variation. But clearly the more developed the country, the higher the per capita output of waste. So I uh, wanted you to get a flavor of this. As you go into rural and smaller cities, these, these values will reduce. Uh, as we become more uh, prosperous, we consume more and therefore more waste comes out. So our footprint no longer remains small. So just to uh, uh, end this uh, discussion, we did this W into N. But we have to remember W is not constant, but increases with time for two reasons, definitely. As population increases and as uh, per capita waste generation increases on account of increase in GDP. So future population can be estimated as current population into 1 plus Y over 100 into N, where Y is the uh, rate of population growth in percentage. India, it appears to be 1.2%. Japan has minus 0.1%. Germany has wavered on both sides of zero. It was a little low earlier. Now it seems to be picking up. But this is, these, these are estimated rates and you know, it depends on the time span. So one is the population will keep on growing. The second is that the waste generation rate will depend on what it is today plus the rate of GDP growth. There seems to be a correlation factor alpha. So we don't want to get into great detail on this, but there seems to be a direct uh, correlation between uh, waste generation, even if your population is constant, if your GDP per capita goes up, what's the rate of growth of GDP in India? Uh, six to seven percent. So this is going to go up, right? So basically what you need to do is for future years, you have to look at the future population, you have to look at the future WG for the ith year and for each year you have to compute it and you have to sum it for your n years. So this is an underestimate, really this is an underestimate uh, but this is just a very simple way of looking at things. <clears throat> the third thing I wanted to uh, uh, talk about in planning which we discussed, as we were closing last lecture we talked about the closure and the post-closure plan. And our idea is that the landfill component should continue to remain functional till the closure period, post-closure period is over, typically 30 years. We must achieve the ended use. And suppose the ended use is not golf course or parking area, then we have to restore it to its original condition. And, and, and we would, I would like to address this a little more in detail. If you are making a golf course or a parking area, it will be commercially maintained, right? You will be getting an income, you will be maintaining it, you will be getting, you will be able to monitor all the signs of settlements, of something, uh, leachate coming out from somewhere, if at all. So you are able to, but if you are not going to be there, then how do you restore it to the original condition? Of course, till that time, we have to remove the surface water, we have to do the maintenance, and we have to do the periodic inspection and monitoring. So conceptually, this is what the broad picture of landfills is. We found a location which nobody was using for disposing our waste. We cleared it up, and we put a liner, and we put our waste. 
in daily cells, then yearly phases, and then when it was all over, we had a covered landfill. And in terms of covers, everybody wants a green cover. Nobody wants a concrete cover. Nobody wants a black cover. You know, all your water tanks are black. Remember, Syntex water tanks. But then people said, yeah, black doesn't look good. Let's have white. And then you started getting uh, pigmented uh, different colors of water, water tanks. So if this is grass, and if this is the waste, we have to monitor this for 30 years. And if you have to walk off, two things have to be assured that this is, this is stable. It is no longer having bad emissions. That's number one. The second important aspect is grass cannot survive by itself. You know, you have a garden, you have a park. Grass survives because it is irrigated. There is a mali. The horticulture people are looking after it. They are beautiful hedges. But vegetation in the wild survives by itself. So native vegetation is self-supported. That means it, if there is a monsoon and then there is a summer and then there is a winter, the vegetation may go from green to brown. And it may not be visible for some time, but it will sprout again. So that means that vegetation survives without being given additional irrigation water or fertilizer. So our aim is that if the waste inside this has become stable, before I leave, I have to get the na natural vegetation back on this. Because if I don't, what will happen? The grass will go after I walk off. Once the grass goes, the binder to the top soil goes, erosion will start, and then progressively this will deteriorate. If the waste is not stable, that means if the emissions of the gas and the leachate are not within the acceptable limits of the Pollution Control Board, we can't leave this site. And I've told you this, then we have to take other measures after the uh, design period as to what to do about it. But this is what we are saying we will do in restoring it to its original condition. So here we have homogenized or harmonized the waste with the surrounding environment. Okay? So this is the larger picture. Immediate picture, of course, is to how not to pollute the environment. But can we really walk off a site? So if you see, most of these cycles are 50 to 100 years, industrial areas. If you, if you look historically, industrial areas start becoming degraded with time. We were not taking adequate uh, measures, our land was becoming polluted with time. So before you could reuse the land, you had to rehabilitate the land, you had to remove the pollution. So this is exactly what we are talking about. So any questions on this aspect about the planning aspects which we discussed, there's two, three fine points, otherwise we can start with liners. Great. So I believe we are all on the same plane and we would like to see that we are looking at uh, the bottom element which prevents the leachate from going into the ground. Depending on the type of landfill, I mean, you may have more cover or less cover in comparison to the liner. Both are impermeable elements, a cover and a liner in the dry tome concept. If it's a below ground landfill, you can see the liner is more than the cover. If it's an above ground landfill, then the cover is more than the liner. And if it's a side slope landfill, then the cover and the liner appears to be similar in, in the quantities involved. The major difference between the cover and the liner is that both are impervious or have very, very, very low permeability, but the liner gets buried. It's not accessible. The cover is always accessible for repair. So the risk of leakage here is much higher. And therefore, this has to be, we have to be very uh, careful about the design of the liner. And I've already said this earlier, this is just a, 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 a figure which will keep on coming again and again. The cover is a multi-component, multi-layer device, and the liner is a multi-component, multi-layer device. As you go forward, this will begin to make more and more sense, uh, all these details. So what are the functional requirements of the barrier in the liner system? We have a hydraulic barrier. So the first statement is it should be impervious. 
So as I said, I am not aware of any impervious material. I am not aware. Eventually, a liquid will pass through, if not by gravity flow, then by diffusion, by a sheer push at the molecular level of the difference in concentration. Even a plastic sheet which looks impermeable to us, eventually a gas comes out of the plastic sheet because you can, under concentration and pressure differences, have something moving out. Very, very, very slow. Our objective is simple. Whatever comes out of the landfill is like whatever comes out of a factory. As long as the emissions are less than the permissible values, we are happy. So when we say it should be impervious, what we mean is it should be very, very low permeability. Everything has a permeability because nothing is a solid matrix. And the other thing is that it should remain intact under settlement of subsoil. Now, as you build up your waste, you're passing stresses onto the ground, the soil will settle a little, and therefore, whatever you put at the bottom should not be a rigid element which will crack, right? This is more important in covers than in liners because in the cover, the waste itself is settling, so the settlements are much larger. But that does not take us away from the fact that the subsoil is also settling and God forbid, if you are surrounded by loose or soft soil, then maybe the settlements can be high. So your containment system has to remain intact. Over and above this, uh, it has to remain functional for 50 to 100 years. So it is not like you know, I can put araldite. Do you know what's araldite? No. What is the what, what kind of glue are you using nowadays? If you have to stick two pieces of wood together or two pl plastic something breaks, what do you use to put them together to join them? <laughs> Louder! I can't hear you. Fevi quick. Okay, so everything has to be quick. So my araldite or aral quick. Uh, that's what I meant. So the point is. You can join something, but if that material with which you join it with time shows some kind of shrinkage or cracking, then it's not the material that we want. So we must be sure that the material with which you are working will remain for 50 to 100 years. Like we are sure about bricks, like we are sure about concrete, we are also sure about the reinforcement bars, but sometimes when there's a lot of seepage of water, then corrosion does occur and it does cause spalling. But we do know that cement, bricks, concrete, these are materials which will last for 50 to 100 years. So we must have that. And these should not be affected by leachate. Now, the leachate can be of various types. You can have leachate from a municipal solid waste landfill, you can have a leachate from a hazardous waste landfills, and you can have a leachate from a construction and demolition. So, the intensity of the concentration will change and also the constituents. So it should be able to withstand the leachate. You see many times concrete floors, if you go to uh, chemical factories, if acid is falling on it, a pH is uh, high or low, it starts to affect the flooring. So we need to have a material which is not affected and it should not degrade with time. There, there should be no uh, degradation of the material. Uh, like ultraviolet stability, sunlight or oxidation, uh, what example can I take? If you have a, a plastic chair and if you leave it in the sunlight for a long time, the plastic becomes more and more rigid and more and more rigid and one day it cracks. Maybe this happens to your hostel chairs as well. If you have a hose pipe by which you use for gardening your water, and you leave it in the sun or leave it in the open, not even in the sun with time, it becomes more and more stiffer and stiffer and then you eventually it cracks. So these are not materials which are uh, 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 remaining stable with time. And oxidation is a big culprit. When we are, when we are talking of uh, something for a year, that's fine. But when we are so talking for something for 100 years, then we are worried about oxidation. And you and I are getting oxidized. Is that right? To live longer, what do you have to have? Antioxidants. 
So first we are breathing oxygen and then we are saying we are getting oxidized. So we everything has gets affected eventually in a very slow way by oxidation. So these have to be stable against oxidation for this period and should not show long, long term cracking. That means works fine today, does not work fine after 10 years. That is not all, there are many more things the liner has to do. It should withstand the load due to moving men and machines. Now, yeah, I mean, you are going to put spread a liner in a football field and then you are going to spread the waste. Well, maybe the dozer will not directly move on the liner, but there will be a layer of waste. But people are moving on it, the people who are spreading the liner are moving on it. So, it should not be damaged by moving men and machines and it should not be damaged by the stresses coming on account of 15, 20, 30, 40 meter high waste. This should not get. Should be easy to construct. Now, th there are two types of materials, those which are prefabricated and those which are constructed on site. And this typically the problem in your um, in situ construction versus pre prefabricated construction. Prefabricated construction, brilliant. Everything in the factory, perfect temperature, pressure, pH, humidity, everything comes out wonderful. On the site, it depends on the mood of the operator of the labor and uh, if he is not in a good mood, God help, the quality of joints is going to be that much uh, different from what he does all the time. So, we prefer prefabricated stuff because it is better quality, but when you get prefabricated stuff, it can only, it is of a limited size. Whether it is cloth, whether it is polymer, whether it is a bitumen, a bituminous sheet, it, all these may come in the form of a roll, but still it is limited size. Whatever is being done in situ is not limited in size, except if you want to stop working. For example, when you put the roof of your house, um, how many of you been involved in a construction of a house, either in your BTEC project or your father's house or your grandfather's house? How many of you actually seen a roof being cast? One, I can't believe it. Two, okay, many of you. So what is the critical thing about the roof? When you cast a roof, when you're doing concreting of a roof, and I'm talking of RCC roof, what is the most important thing? It has to be completed in one go. You can't say I'll put half the roof today, I'll go home and sleep, have a hearty meal and I'll come and do the other half of the roof tomorrow. I can join the two. There's not an issue that the material will not join, but you'll get a joint. So when you do in situ construction, you can make as big a thing as uh, you want provided you're working 24-7. So, in situ construction requires that there be no cold joints, no construction joints, no uh, abrupt stoppage. See what will happen. Suppose I do a roof in one go. I started in the morning, it didn't complete by the evening. I put on the floodlights, I got second shift of labor. The concrete kept on coming fresh, 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 and move forward. The back part of the concrete was setting, the front was fresh, 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 fresh. Now, if another guy does not do that, he says, okay, I will take a break, I will come after 8 hours. This concrete has set. The new concrete is fresh. You can chisel around and make the contact intimate, but always between the fresh concrete and the old concrete, there will be a joint. It will become a preferential path of seepage. So, should be easy to construct with existing technology. If you are getting prefabricated, then they should be joinable. If you get something which gets damaged, then it should be repairable. I mean, you are working with a plastic sheet, your screwdriver falls, you get a hole in the plastic sheet, you got to repair it. And some people say it should be self-healing. I mean, you forget, you forget to heal it, it should heal by itself, like your wound. You have a self-healing wound, you have a small cut, you forget about it, you are all right. So do we have self-healing materials? Maybe they'll be biotic, maybe they may not be biotic. Should be amenable to quality check after construction. You can always say, sir, I have made an impermeable barrier for you. I don't, I don't believe you. I want, I want you to prove to me that it's leak proof. So if you have an overhead water tank, it's above the ground. If it leaks, you'll get to know, you'll fill it up with water. 
but if you have a liner below the ground, then you can't go under the liner to check the leakage. So it should have uh, on-site leak-proof checks, quality control tests. Should not slip along slopes. In, in liners, you have slopes. In covers, you have slopes. It should not be something which slips. And in the end, it should be economical. So this may not be that important, but between alternatives which, fee, which satisfy uh, all the above, uh, you should take the most economical alternative. So now I've given you the boundary conditions. Now you tell me the materials that we are, that we are used to using uh, uh, for being hydraulic barriers. As I said, we are making a hydraulic barrier. First, we are not going to look at cost. We are not going to look at cost. Just tell me the materials which you think function well as hydraulic barriers. Clay. Clay is not impervious. It is low permeability. Anything else? Oh, you have all the money. I'm going to give you a million dollars. Money is not a constraint. Let's look at the best materials that we can use to meet all our requirements. Concrete, OK. What else? I mean, everything which your water tanks are made of is a good indicator that if it can, water tank can hold water, Quite clearly, it is a hydraulic barrier. So what else? Plastics. Plastics. So metal sheets. Metal sheets. I mean, many of the uh, uh, basements, if you will go, they'll put aluminum sheets uh, next to the uh, retaining wall so that the water doesn't come in. So metal sheets. So we've got steel tanks, we've got concrete tanks, we've got plastic tanks. We don't have a clay tank, okay? But these work. Anything else? What kind of sealants, uh, water barriers do you use in dams? What kind of wa water barriers do you for wa do you use for waterproofing? And we are going, just going to look at all the civil engineering materials with which we deal. So we'll see which one is the one which can help us now. You know DPC. Damp proof course. What do we put on a damp proof course for the, preventing the water to rise up the walls? No, we don't put aluminium sheets in a damp proof course. PCC also is not impervious. You know, if you may, again, I asked you, were you involved in construction of a house, a room? If you are not, go, go and uh, watch the construction uh, which is taking place next to the LHC on the, as you approach the LHC on the left side, something is being constructed. So I don't know what they do for DPC nowadays, but in my time, they used to put something which was black. Bitumen, coal tar, whatever you want to call it, uh, that was uh, waterproofing material. So bitumen. So you get these so many waterproofing magical things for walls and basements. Some you can put by a brush. Some you can spray. Aren't these uh, magical things? So let's put magical things at the bottom. Others. And these can be epoxies, these can be raisins, these can be sprays, these can be brush-ons, these can be emulsions, so all kinds of stuff used on walls. Used on walls, roofs, and floors. So these are the various alternatives. Uh, let's now see what can work and what cannot work. Uh, 
uh, clay what is the problem it is not impervious it has some permeability and water will eventually come out it can anything else it is has some low permeability that is one problem anything else can it take the stresses can it take the stresses of a 30 meter high waste dump or will you have a bearing capacity failure I do not know. What about concrete? Concrete also has low permeability, probably lower than clay if it is well compacted, well vibrated. But what is the other problem with concrete? Is it flexible or is it rigid? It is not likely to take settlements. Is clay likely to take settlements or will it crack? Concrete will crack, crack. I mean, uh, so PCC will crack, RCC will also crack. Weakened design and uncracked. Weakened design? Uncracked section of what size? I am trying to put a concrete floor 500 meters by 500 meters just for you to get the idea this is 5 football fields in this direction and 5 football fields in the other direction. Uh, so, that just about puts us in its perspective maybe it is the size of all those lawn tennis courts that you have between the hostels on that side. So, PCC will crack I cannot make an RCC slab which is that wide. I have to give joints, I have to give construction joints. So, the moment you give construction joints, it is no longer a problem about the impermeability of the slab, it becomes a problem of the impermeability of the joint or you can always put all kinds of water stops and you know sealants, but joints are more difficult to seal than the parent material. So, there are issues of low permeability, rigidity and joints. Plastics, plastics are almost impermeable, almost, but they also have low permeability, very, very low permeability, much lower than clay and concrete. But do plastics have some other problems? Yeah, so these, these are puncture, tear, so and they also have problems of joints because plastics will come to you in rolls. So, what is the widest width of roll that you can get to a site? Three meters. So, there is a suggestion that it is three meters. Well, one thing is very clear I would like as wide a roll as possible because then the number of joints goes down, right. So, how much is the widest roll? The two limitations how wide can you manufacture? and how wide can you transport. So, kis mein transport karo gaya? I, I have this great simile that you know the space shuttle, I have done this with you before, if I have let me know. Okay. So, the size of the space shuttle, the width and the diameters is governed by the size of the backside of a horse and what is this interlinkage? Uh, you, you have a you have a space shuttle and it has to be put together. So, the jets are made somewhere else, uh, the chambers are made somewhere else, the payload at the top is made somewhere else and all these have to come together at one place assembled and either you assemble everything at the side or they have to come from somewhere. So, uh, that means everything is governed by transportation. How do you transport things? 
no, I don't transport anything by a horse. And not nowadays. I mean, Sherlock Holmes used to be there. If you're watching the serial, <laughs> then you used to go in a lovely uh, horse uh, carriage, right? But today, it'll either come in a truck, or it'll come by ship, or it'll come by a helicopter, or it'll come by a train. Four modes, by land, by water, by air. So the helicopters can only lift this much and bring it along. So I think the propulsion jets of the space shuttle are sent by rail. So you can have a narrow gauge in India or a wide gauge or maybe even a wider. But once you are sending something by rail, its size is fixed by the size of the rail track. You can overflow a little bit, but you can't send a hugely wide. You can't take this room on a, uh, on a railway back. Right? So whether you send it by roll, road, then you have to undergo, go beneath flyovers, the size is limited. You send it by rail, you have to go through tunnels, the size is limited. You try and pick it up by helicopter, well, I don't know how many helicopters will pick up this building. You have the payload issue. You can send it by ship, sure, pick it up by crane, but does the ship reach where you want to launch it from? It may not. So if you're going by train, always remember that the width of the track, what governs the width of the train track? A road is of variable width, you know, single lane, two lane, four lane, six lane. Expressways have how many lanes? <clears throat> four this way, four that way, five this way, five that way. You can have eight to ten. So what's the width of a road? It can be as small as three meters when you're going to a village, and it can be as wide as? Okay, 3.75. You can be as small as 3.75 meters, and how wide can an expressway be? 50. Don't bother. I mean, the Gurgaon tall, probably 50 meters wide. How wide is the rail track? Where did this come from? Why did they make this rail track one or one point something meters wide? I mean, who fixed this? Or why didn't they make it three meters wide? So you have to go back historically. What I understand is that when the rail came, before that, the mode of transport was the horse with the carriageway. Two horses put together used to pull a carriage, right? So the width of the wheels of the carriage, uh, cart or carriage was decided by the width of the backside of two horses standing side to side with sufficient clearance. So when they started to put the rail tracks, they had to put it in areas where there was no road, but only horses used to go. And horses, not the ones which went without a rolling carriageway, because then they could go in any which way, because they have a hopping motion. So the rolling carriageway went at grade, slight incline. So all these were already laid out. So the tracks were put in the impressions of the wheels of the carriage. So the size of two backsides of two horses governed the width of the carriageway track and on it went the rail and that's our rail track today. Of course, there must be other considerations why it didn't become wider with time. But eventually, the propulsion jet of the space shuttle comes on a rail track and therefore, the maximum diameter that it can have is governed by the backside of a horse. Because if the backside of a horse had been larger, the rail track would have been wider, and you would have been able to put a wide, more wider propulsion uh, unit on the track. So the same thing applies here. I want to send in a huge roll. What is the length and what is the width of the roll? So if I'm sending it by truck, then the width of the roll is I can put the roll lying down. So there are certain limitations. So plastics, we said tear, puncture, joints.
But one can always make a plastic which is going to be puncture and tear proof. And a very simple example is the, my shoe has a top, your shoe has a top, right? And uh, you walk in it, you play in it, something falls on it, does it puncture? I'm not talking of the sports shoes which may have cloth, but if you have a leather shoe or a plastic shoe, then you will notice that the top of a shoe will last you for four or five years or maybe three, four years. You agree with me on that? If I draw, drop a screwdriver on this, maybe my toe will break, but my leather will not have a hole in it. So if I make the plastic sufficiently thick, I can definitely ensure that it may not get damaged during installation. Because if these were to get damaged, every time I hit something, then I'd have to buy a new pair every few days. And we do hit it across ever so often. So please remember, we can take care of this issue about being a, a tear and puncture. Okay, metal sheets, no problem. They are also flexible to some extent. Well, again, there's the issue of joints. And currently, metal is more expensive than plastic on a performance basis. So there's an issue of cost. Bitumen, wonderful material. Clay is prefabricated or on site? Yeah, it comes from a borrow area, but it is spread on site and compacted on site. Concrete is prefabricated or in situ? In situ construction. Plastics, prefabricated, they come from a factory. Metal sheets, prefabricated, they come from a, uh, from a uh, factory. Bitumen, bitumen comes to you in drums, the main element of bitumen is it has to be heated. When once it is heated, it's liquidy. You can spread it and then it sets. So working with bitumen is difficult. Given a chance, would you be working in an asphaltic plant laying roads or would you be working on a concrete roof? Given a chance. Suppose you have to work 10 hours a day just installing or constructing with bitumen and constructing with concrete, which would you prefer? Working at the ambient temperature is easier than working at an elevated temperature. So issues are of quality control. When you work with hot material, the issues of quality control, right? So bitumen is good, it's flexible, and because it is in situ, the issue of joints doesn't come. You can keep on spreading it as long as you are. Or you can also get it in the form of sheets. So bitumen is both. You can get bituminous sheets. For example, you have these bituminous sheets for putting on your rooftop. They have a plastic or a, you know, a, a polymeric base on which the bitumen is already pre-spread. And you can roll it out and heat it and join it. And bitumen is easy to join. You can heat and join, heat and join. So bitumen is flexible, joinable, it is also prefab, but it is hot. And not hot as in hot and happening. Hot as in hot and burning. <laughs> Otherwise, you get a lot of these words which are used. Others. So other than these materials, we have others. Uh, so what about all these waterproof paints and waterproof sprays and waterproof uh, liquids, what, what about them, which are used in walls. So these others work well on a strong, plain substrate. I mean, if you want to paint something, you need a wall. Would you like to paint something on soil? What will happen? I ask you to paint, okay, this is soil, please paint some impermeable uh, liquid on it. What, what will happen? You'll take a brush and you'll paint it. What will happen? Why will it not get painted? What you're trying to say, I think, is that when you will put the paintbrush on the soil, 
instead of the paint going to the soil, the soil may get stick to the paintbrush. That's what you're trying to articulate. The substrate is not strong and uniform. So you can't paint anything on soil. The soil might want to paint itself onto the uh, material that you're trying. So you may not be able to transfer it to the soil. So all these things, which are these magical resins, polyurethanes and uh, waterproofing compounds, they work well on walls and floors and roofs because the base is very strong and you can spread them very thin and very uniformly. On soil, there are two problems. You don't have a plain, thin, flat finish. You just don't have it. I've already told you, you want to use an earth moving, you want to use a dozer to make the a bulldozer to make your ground flat. Well, it is only that flat. It's not like flat as in the bathroom floor where you know you can give an inclination of one in thousand. Our flat will be undulating flat. So that's first issue that you don't have a perfectly horizontal. And the second issue is that the soil particles, especially if you try and think, can I put paint on sand? No. Can I put a spray on sand? Yes. But the moment you put your foot on it, it will just displace itself. So these all don't work. <clears throat> so quickly, we worked with water storage tanks. You can have concrete steel polymers. In canals, I use concrete. I also have brick lining. I have clay. I have polymeric membranes. Uh, the word plastic, I'm using polymeric here. Uh, dams and barrages, we have concrete cores. Uh, I mean, uh, concrete for stopping the water, clay cores, asphaltic membranes, roofs and basements, concrete, waterproofing materials, asphaltic membranes, asphalt. So as I said, concrete, rigid, thin, in situ construction, joints, cracks. Steel aluminum sheets, rigid or flexible, thin, prefabricated, joining on site, quality of joint and costs. Clay, flexible, clay has to be thick. You can't put uh, a few millimeters of clay and say, I've got an impermeable barrier. So it has to be thick, means it may have to be in terms of meters. In situ compaction, it has low permeability, but it gets shrinkage cracks. So when you see this, uh, when a drought comes, you know, all these uh, uh, periodicals and magazines will show a farmer sitting on uh, a dry field, and you'll see these hexagonal patterns in the soil and those are shrinkage cracks. And the dry lake bed on which he's sitting is the clay at the bottom of a water pond. When it dries, it gives you shrinkage cracks. But do remember, these cracks are reversible. They are self-healing. If you take a clay which has shrunk and you give it water, what will happen? If it can shrink, it can swell. So these shrinkage cracks do close themselves and therefore they are reversible. This is an important thing because one of the great negative uh, uh, aspects highlighted in clays are shrinkage cracks. And you feel, oh, yeah, this crack is five millimeter wide, all the water will go down. But the fact is, every time a lake dries up or a pond dries up and rains come again, all the water doesn't go down because the cracks heal. So they have a self-healing capacity. Polymeric membranes, flexible, thin, prefabricated, they have to be joined on the site. The issue is about the quality of the joining, the puncture, and the tears. Asphaltic materials, flexible, thin, construction at site or prefabricated, quality of construction, they also require strong base and you have to work in a hot environment, which I have unfortunately not written here. So maybe I would like to add that. So hot working temperature, waterproofing materials, flexible, thin, uh, application can be done on site but they require a strong base. So quite clearly, I am not, are you able to get one material which you can use? From all that we have discussed, what we have written here, do you have one material which you would like to use? You would like to use plastic. And then you will assure me that there will be no tears and no punctures. And when you join, and when you join these things together, the joints will be 100% leak proof. Well, unfortunately, I have not seen even one uh, plastic installation where there has been a perfect waterproofing. It's like, you know, you have this, uh, the vegetable vendor, he'll have a thin plastic sheet, the blue one. 
but if there is one pin prick in it, the water will keep on coming out from that side. So, what it appears is that what experience shows is that with thin polymeric membranes, leakage through punctures or tearing, even if we take the maximum precaution, there will be some holes. So, this gives you fast seepage. You make a puncture in a uh, plastic sheet, the water will come out very fast. Problem with thick clay barriers here, they are not totally impervious. There may be some heterogeneity of the clay. There may be some shrinkage cracks. Therefore, you will get slow seepage through large areas. So the answer to our problem is a composite barrier. We do not use one material at the base of a landfill. No single standalone material. We are talking of a polymeric membrane in intimate contact with a clay barrier. That's the liner that we use. There may be some holes in the geomembrane, but the moment there are holes in the geomembrane, they will be stopped by the clay. And try and use a geomembrane of significant thickness to prevent puncture or tear. But even despite that, you get punctures or tears in the field. So, let me first come here. This is what the composite barrier is. Typically, we use a high density polyethylene geomembrane, which is 1.5 to 2.5 mm thick. This is pretty thick. And it rests on a clay which must be at least 1 meter thick. It must be compacted. And the permeability is specified. It should be less than 10 to the power of minus 9 meters per second or 10 to the power of minus 7 centimeters per second. This is called a composite, single composite barrier or a single composite liner system. And just understand the fundamental principle. It's very important for you to understand. You have a geomembrane and I put two pin pricks in it and all the water will finish which is standing on top. There is no way it can hold water. You put a clay barrier, water will not finish, it will always remain on top, but it will come out drop by drop eventually. Eventually it will come out. I put the geomembrane in close contact with the clay. Please understand, intimate contact. Then what happens, the large area of the clay, no water is coming. This through the pinhole water come and it is stopped by the clay. So rapid seepage through small holes. Slow seepage over the entire area, very slow seepage through small area. So all this which doesn't have any puncture, the clay will not allow any seepage. And where there is a puncture, the clay will inhibit the seepage. So this is the concept of the system. And remember, many people install this wrong. This is correct. You have a clay at the bottom and geomembrane at the top. If you don't have intimate contact, please understand what's happening. Suppose you have sand in between or you have an air gap. What happens? You have a hole here. The whole thing becomes filled with water. If the whole thing becomes filled with water, you again have water over a large area and the entire clay will seep. So critical to this is that if you have a hole here, then the water should not be able to travel laterally under the surface of the geomembrane or of the polymer. The clay should be there images. So need intimate contact and that's called a good installation condition. So I just again bring this back to you. The most critical thing not written here is the intimate contact. If there's a little bit of air gap or uh, permeable soil in between, you'll have a problem. Okay, I'd like to uh, sort of uh, try and wind up now. A single liner system means it's not composite. It has one of the elements, right? It may have clay, it may have geomembrane, but it is not composite. A single composite liner, so please understand single liner systems are different from single composite liners. Single composite liner is what we saw. Clay in intimate contact with geomembrane. You can have a double liner system, two walls or two polymeric, you, you have double walled uh, overhead tanks, an inner wall and an outer wall. But they are not a, they are not, 
they are not double composite liners. Double composite liner means repeating the element. And quickly, I bring your attention to the bottom three diagrams. This is a single liner system, only clay. Maybe it will be used in a CND landfill. This is the waste. There is a little bit of sand and pipes, which we will explain next time what they are. But the waste rests on clay. It's a single liner system. Not used for municipal solid waste landfills, not used for hazardous waste landfills. The minimum requirement for uh, municipal solid waste landfills is a single composite liner. There must be a geomembrane in close contact with the clay. And the minimum requirement of hazardous waste landfills is a double composite liner. Please distinguish between double liner and double composite liner. What is a double liner? If I put one clay and one clay with a drainage layer in between, it's a double liner. But a double composite liner, or if I put one plastic sheet, a gap, and another plastic sheet, that's a double liner. But that's not a double composite liner. A double composite liner means one composite liner here and another composite liner here. So this is typically used for hazardous waste landfills. And this is typically used for municipal solid waste landfills. And such a system can be used at CND waste landfills. So let me uh, revisit what I was saying. We don't use single liner systems for landfills, except for CND or inert waste. However, single liner systems are used in canals. You put plastic sheets in canals. You use it in ponds. You use it in lakes for drinking water reservoirs or water reservoirs. Single composite liner systems used in landfills. Double liner system not used in landfills, but maybe used in double walled underground or overhead tanks. Double composite liner system used in landfills. So these go for hazardous waste landfills and the others go. So I'll leave you with these um, uh, uh, diagrams. Uh, we will discuss what this is, but this is the leachate collection layer. We always said there will be a straw on top of the liner. So we have a, a sand layer here or a sand and a gravel layer here. So if there is any leachate, it will be taken away by these pipes. So you have the waste, the leachate collection system, and the liner. We are only discussing this today. Leachate collection systems we will discuss in the next class. So if there is any uh, uh, clarification or doubt in your mind that you would uh, like to discuss, you're welcome. So we have introduced the concept of a composite liner, and we have introduced the concept that no single material is a good standalone containment system for 50 to 100 years. So with this, uh, we stop. Thank you.